Standing next to me I don't want to be left here If I'm not falling on my knees Don't wake me up If I'm not where I need to be I'll wait a little longer Till you're standing next to me I don't want to go If you're not standing next to me I don't want to be left here If I'm not falling on my knees Don't wake me up If I'm not Standing next to me Sure. 
Sharif out of nowhere said, okay, well, we're going to sing Echo on Sunday. And so we go through the motions and we start singing this song that we've sung so many times before and the words just started to register to me. And they said, when my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided that I'm not giving up. That's right. And so I went to work the next day and I said, Lord, that I'm not good enough, but you say you said. that you are enough for me, God. So I'm going to decide that I can do this job that you gave me that I didn't know that I was even going to have. God, you gave me this job that I didn't even ask for. God, you gave me this job that they told me I didn't even qualify for. And as soon as I started to echo what I knew about God, as soon as I started to echo God's word is when I began to understand 
Today. 
Spirit who refines us, who purifies us, who keeps us holy, who says, no, that wasn't right, so get back right, you know what I mean? That's God. God is responding to your request. He said, you knock and the door shall be open. And if you pursue him, he will bless it. Okay, God is with us through the fire. 
he never leaves. He's omnipresent. He's Jesus. We can call on him. And he shows up. There he is in the midst of us. Because he's here. He's here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are in this place. For this scripture to you that he who dwells in the secret place of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty i will say of the lord he is my fortress my refuge my god in whom i trust surely he will save me from the fowler's snare from the deadly pestilence he'll cover me with his feathers and under his wings i'll find refuge his faithfulness will be my shield and my rampart I'll not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that destroys at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but you'll only see it with your eye. You'll see the punishment of the wicked when you make the most high your dwelling place. For no harm comes before thee, no disasters near thy dwelling. For he has commanded his angels to take charge of you and protect you in all your ways. That's security only found in God. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, Joey, man, I feel like I'm in the fire, the crucible of affliction. I'm in the fire of, of worry, the fire of doubt, the fire of uncertainty. I would not say those things are attributes of the main thing. You're in the fire of faith. And in this fire of faith, God is looking for fighters. He's looking for men and women of God who will not bend, who will not bow, and they will not burn in the midst of the fire. They'll come out stronger. They'll come out wiser. They'll come out more anointed. They'll come out more full of God than ever before. Though you're in a fire of affliction right now, God is developing your faith and your fortitude, your spiritual muscle. Don't get weary in well-doing. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want love because God is love. I shall not want peace because he gives peace that surpasses understanding. I shall not need joy, for in his presence there's fullness of joy. I shall not need a friend, for he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I shall not need prosperity, because he anoints my head with oil. He makes me to lie down in green pastures for his name's sake, and goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Come on, is that your heart today? With those hands lifted to the Lord, God, just let that refiner fire continue to burn. God, it's not a matter of getting out of the fire. It's a matter of faith being built in the fire. God, you said we'll come out without the smell of smoke upon us. We will come out of this fire with not bound by anything that has tried to hold us back. We will not be bound by dependencies of man. We will not be bound by addiction. We will not be bound by past hurts or mistakes. We will not be bound by the enemy's schemes and lies. We will not be bound by our own past mistakes. We will be living an abundant, clear-eyed, pursuing God life. We will be living an anointed life, a prosperous life, a joy-filled life, a healthy life, a whole life, an anointed by God life. Thank you, Lord, for it. We receive your protection in the midst of our fire. We receive your, your protection in the midst of a nation that's gone crazy. We receive your protection in a world that's gone nuts. And we thank you, God, that we may be nuts, but we're screwed on the right bolt. We belong to you, and you belong to us. And we are thankful today that this is the day. You've made it. I'll be glad in it. Come on, put your hands together and give God a shout of praise in his house. Well, I welcome you today to Oasis Church. My name's Joey. I want you, before you sit down, greet somebody today. Say good afternoon, good morning, whatever time y'all woke up. But say hello to somebody, introduce yourself, smile, and say your name. Say, my name is, and repeat, we're glad you're here today. Well, happy, happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Would you give this amazing worship team a round of applause? So awesome leading us. While you're clapping, welcome our online audience. What's up, online family? Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know where you're watching from today. And one more round of applause for our guests in the house. Would you give our guests a round of applause? We're grateful you're here today. Thanks for coming. If you are a guest, 
We would love for you to text the word CONNECT at Oasis94000. If you're not a guest and you haven't done that yet, please do that. We'd love to know who our family is. At least you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you. It is Palm Sunday. We're kicking off Holy Week. We're so honored that you're spending this day with us, and we hope you will be a part of all the things coming that we have prepared for you this week. And we've got a good Friday service for you at 7 p.m. Uh, right here in the sanctuary. We'll have a time of communion. It'll be a one-hour service, 7 p.m. Good Friday. On Saturday, we have an egg hunt that is for you, for our church family. It's for our community. It is going to be huge. It's at McNair High School. If you were there last year, you know how big it is. A lot of good stuff happening there. And then, of course, our Sunday services for Easter. So we celebrate the risen Savior every day of our lives as believers. But Easter does tend to get a little bit more hype. So this is an opportunity for you to invite your friends and family that wouldn't normally come to church. They expect an invitation on Easter. So it's so easy to invite somebody. Tag them on social media. Get your friends and family here. Hey, enjoy this quick video showing you a little bit of what it might look like. Fun, fun, fun. So be a part of all the things happening here this coming weekend for Easter. Don't miss out on anything. It's just a great opportunity to invite people, again, that wouldn't normally come. It's an easy invite, so we hope that you will do that. We're just thankful that you're here today. We welcome you. We're grateful that you're picking Sunday to spend with us to be the day that you draw closer to the Lord. And our hope is always that whatever happens in here on Sunday is a launching point for Monday. So that Monday, you do the same thing you're doing today. You get up, you worship God, you make the decision that he's your savior. You just continue that day after day, digging deeper, uh, digging those foundational roots down deep that you have in your relationship with God. So I had an interesting experience happen earlier this week. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the dermatologist to have a, a, a mole looked at that I thought looked a little bit strange because I am a fair, pale person, kind of like a Disney princess. That's what I like to call myself because I am so fair. Um, I, am, I have a lot of moles. I'm a very moly gal, but I'm holy moly. <laughs> That's right. My new nickname. I'm holy and I'm moly. Um, but I do have quite a few moles, so I always am aware of when they look a little different. So I went and had one looked at the dermatologist, and they biopsied it, and sure enough, unfortunately, it came back that it was cancerous. And so they quickly scheduled me to have it surgically removed. They don't want to leave that there any length of time. And so I went in a couple days ago to have it surgically removed. And so the way that they did it at this particular surgeon's office, they removed a large portion of it to make sure that they got all the cancer. That was their hope in that first initial surgery. And then they make you wait in the waiting room for two hours because they send that to the lab to biopsy it, they don't want to release you to go home until they know for sure that they've gotten all the cancer out. And so I sat in the waiting room. I wasn't, didn't have the wounds closed up yet because then just in case they had to take more of my skin, they wanted to make sure that they could do that. And so thankfully two hours goes by and they call me back and praise God, they got all the cancer out. No, no worries. So I'm really thankful for that. So then they, you know, sewed up the wound and sent me on my way. But what I thought is so interesting about this pro process that I went through, if I had walked in to that surgeon's office and he said, okay, I'm going to cut out the cancer and we're going to hope that we got it all, but I need you to wait in the waiting room so we can make sure we got it all. What if I would have walked in there and said, no, just cut it out. And when he cuts it out, I said, I'm not going to wait. I don't want to wait to see if you got it all. I don't want to wait for you to sew me up. I'm just going to be on, give me some bandages. I'll slap some bandages on there and I'll be on my way. Of course I wouldn't do that because I want to know that they got all the cancer and I want to have it surgically sewn up correctly so that it heals properly for the future. But do you know that 99.9% .9 of people that call themselves Christian do that every single day with your walk with the Lord? 
We, we, we go to God in the midst of a crisis. We go to God when we feel like we've sinned too much. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, I need you to do this. God, I need you to do that. And then when the crisis is over or when you feel like you've repented enough, you walk away from God only to live the same way the next day. And there's no lasting change. So you don't really know if the cancer was ever fully gone. And you don't ever allow yourself to fully be repaired by God's tender, loving care and sew you up to heal properly. My challenge to you in this next season of life that we're all walking in, this world is crazy, it's chaotic. The only thing that is not chaotic is Jesus. The only foundation that we have is our firm foundation that is Jesus. But if we just come here on Sunday once a month, you know, once every two months, maybe Easter, maybe Christmas, maybe you come every week, but you come in on Sunday and you just leave and then Monday is just back to the same, back to the same, back to the same. It's the, it's the reciprocal process of the same thing. You know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing but expecting different results? We all want to live out our destiny, right? We all would agree that. Like if I said, do you want to live your full destiny? Of course. You say, of course I do. Then do it. Then do it. <laughs> the only way that you're going to live out your destiny, the only way that you're going to propel and live above average is by digging down deep into God's word and not running quickly from thing to thing, not moving from moment to moment, not rushing in, God, forgive me, 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 God, I need this, God, I need this, God, I need this. And then when God answers, you're done until the next crisis hits, until the next moment you feel overwhelmed by sin, until the next time shame is gripping you so strong, you need God again. Friends, we don't have to live that way. Our great privilege as believers is I get to come to God and say, God, remove the cancer. I get to come to God and say, God, I need you to sew me up so I can heal right. I get to do that. But I don't just do that on Sunday. And I don't just do it on Monday. I do it on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. That is what being a disciple of Jesus is. We're disciples of Jesus. The Bible talks about a time when Paul was preaching the good news to people. And the scripture says in Acts, he preached the good news and he made disciples. People became disciples because they heard the preaching. You guys have the opportunity every Sunday to hear preaching. You can make the choice then to become a disciple. And if you are a disciple, that means you're making the choice to become a Christ follower. And if you are making the choice to become a Christ follower, then that means you're going to do all that you can to follow Christ. You're going to surround yourself with people that know more about you uh, than you do about the Word of God. I try to be around people that know more about the Word than I do so they can challenge me and grow me. Every day I'm bringing up different conversations to Joey out of the scripture. I think, what do, you, what do you think this means? What does this mean? Because he challenges me because he knows more than me. So I encourage you, get around people that know more about the word of God than you do. Glean from them. Learn from them. Surround yourself with good community. That's how you grow as a disciple of Jesus. You know, we have a wonderful opportunity being a part of a church body and a part of a church family. It's a beautiful thing to plug in and be a part of a church family. It really is something we don't take lightly and we don't take for granted. Joey's been sharing with you over the past couple of weeks that since we've been pastoring, which is about 15 years, we've been in ministry for about 25, but pastoring specifically in Stockton for 15 years, uh, he shared how he's had a heavy burden for this city. And he's been so weighed down by the burden for Stockton. And so over the years, we've done so many different things to reach the city. From having a church on the south side of town, from building a community center, from all the feeding distribution programs that we do, all the things that we've done because of a burden to reach a city. But as we started to dive into the project in Africa, God began to lift the burden for Stockton specifically off of Joey's shoulders. Because if God didn't lift that burden off of Joey's shoulders, he wouldn't have been able to see what we're able to accomplish in Africa because he would have been so overwhelmed by the burden of Stockton. And so God began to lift that burden off of him so we could then go into Africa and do what God's enabling us to do. And it's amazing. You're going to hear more about it coming up. We finally have our nine children. As of yesterday, they are secure in Oasis Africa. They are in their beds in Africa because of you. But we couldn't have seen that 
had Joey still had this heavy burden for Stockton. We wouldn't have been able to see the potential that we see now in Las Vegas for a church and a, a business, a cafe and a bakery that'll run all week long. We couldn't have seen that while the burden was so heavy for Stockton. And so I share that with you because when a burden is lifted now, we don't have to be in Stockton. God is not mandating us to be in this city because that burden for this city is no longer there. But we are in Stockton because we want to be in Stockton, because we love you. We're here because of you, our Oasis family. We're not here for the city. We're here for you. So as long as you come here and as long as you want to be disciples and you want to be followers of Jesus and you want to grow with us and you want to lean into what, whatever this ministry is, is teaching and doing and, and helping you to grow, as long as you're coming, we'll be here because we love you. We love our family. We love the people that God's bringing to this house. That's how valuable you are. You have to know today that if you feel like nobody cares about you, I do. I think you're aces, man. I'm happy to have you in my world, and I just appreciate your presence here. It's valued. When you're not here, you're missed. So I thank you for being here today. We're going to honor God this morning with our giving. This is an act of worship, a supernatural act of worship. This is not a religious moment. This is an opportunity where we obey God's word that tells us to bring that tithe into the storehouse. And we give God our tithe. We give him our offerings. Those of you that are giving your monthly offering to Pure Heart, thank you so much. Uh, wait till you see these kids that you have rescued and you've put them in a safe place place. You're going to see it uh, next week. Actually, you'll get to see some of the footage that we have that has come in of these children and their faces and they're safe because of you. They're not threatened by anything else because now they're safe because of you. And so thank you for being a conduit. You know, that's what the tithe and the offering is. It's always a hard issue. It's showing God that he's more important than us. He's more important than our resources. We give it back to him. It keeps that connection with God open. But it also reminds us that we're a conduit for what God wants to do through us. When we give our resource, I'm a conduit to see people come to Jesus. Because of your resource, you are a conduit to see children be safe in Africa. You may never meet them on this earth, but when you see the little, their little faces, and pretty soon we'll have pictures out there on the wall for you to be able to see, they're safe because of you. Their names will be written down in glory as they receive Jesus because of you. The Muslim population that surrounds Oasis Africa, people are coming to Jesus because of you. You're a conduit. The great things that do happen in this community of Stockton happen because of you. You are a conduit for that to happen. So please never think it's a religious moment that we do the tithe and the offering. It's giving us the ability to be a conduit for whatever God wants to do with us. So thank you so much for letting this be the storehouse with which you sow your seed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We come before you. We recognize that you are the provider. You gave us our resource and we give it back to you as a, as a sign of just obedience and gratitude for what you did for us. We have freedom. We have salvation. We have forgiveness of sins because of you and your generosity. And so today we give you back our generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? We're going to worship the Lord as we give. Lord, you are good. Your mercies endure forever. Lord, you are so good. You are amazing, Father. you come will you be me- 
sufficient. remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand clap in the house? We're so honored you're here. Thank you for honoring God by your presence and those of you that participated in the worship of the giving. Thank you so much. We can't do it without you. I want to echo what Jennifer said, and I leaned over to her as she shared about that burden being lifted off me specifically. And if you've been in the church for any length of time, I was hyper burdened to do a things in our community uh, that has been overwhelmingly driven by faith and a lot of uh, uh, perseverance, precipitation, uh, uh, you know, sweat, and a lot of stuff uh, that has been overwhelmingly given by hyper faith. But I was sharing with Jennifer, the burden being lifted off me is wonderful because now it can be transferred upon you because my desire is that the people that live in our community here that burden that I had specifically and individually for all those years, that now it transfers on you and you receive that burden to help your city. And then we will do everything in our power at Oasis to make that burden become a faith-giving reality. We really believe that. I'm praying for you to take up your rightful place and position of authority in our church here. I'm praying for families to come to Las Vegas to help us pioneer the church there, that God would speak to you and you would move there with you individually or your family and help us pioneer that church there. Or maybe God's calling you to Africa to bring uh, that gift of hope and life in a mission format there in Africa at a selected time and place and uh, tenure. In other words, not permanent, but a more of a missions lean. But I say that to say, it's a wonderful thing for God to use our lives. And there's something about letting God use you that just brings you joy and peace. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, listen to what this says. It says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the whole world has been crucified to me and I to the world. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I want to talk to you this morning about King Spiracy. This is part one of a four-part message series, Uncovering the Truth About the Lies. And you'll see today the lie that the enemy wants every one of God's children to believe, the lie that they need to add to their salvation. When God has said, it is complete, it is full, and all you need to do is receive the fullness of what he's offered for you at Calvary. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've lost weight. Turn to your other one and say, you're good looking. And go ahead and sit down. You pick. You pick one that you think's better looking than the other. And the one of these encouragement. I always appreciate all of you. Thank you all for being here. Can we give the worship team one more round of applause? Thank you, worship team. I do want to share with you also, family, we want to see you Friday night, 7 p.m. It's our Good Friday service. It'll be one hour right here in this sanctuary from 7 to 8. Like Jennifer said, we'll have communion. We'll have a time of worship together. It'll be wonderful. And then Saturday, everybody say Saturday. Saturday, 9 to noon at McNair Park. You have to sign up for it, though. The Welcome Center will help you, or you can go online because we'll have lots of people there. We want you, your family, your children, grandchildren, neighbors. We want them to partake in that because it is for our church, and we are blessing the community, but we don't want you to go somewhere else when you could be a part of that amazing event this Saturday. We're giving out lots of blessings to our community because we want you to know it's because of you, and our priority is you, as Jennifer said. So I, I think that's a 
wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, how many of you know that you can have as much or as little of God as you're willing to pray to receive? It's really a matter of a choice. Because of the cross, we have everlasting life. Friends, if that was the only message given in Christianity, it's the greatest message on planet earth. We have everlasting life because of the cross of Jesus Christ. There's this conspiracy that this time of year people start going into. Was Christ Lord? Was he Savior? Was he the Son of God? Are the miracles back then relevant for today? Did they close out with the chapter of the first century? Are they true today as they were back then? And these conspiracy theories will haunt you if you don't know the truth amidst the lies. Because of the great triumph at the cross, we now have peace with God. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, but such as I have, I give it unto you. Not only do we have everlasting life, not only do we have peace with God, but we have divine healing over every form of sickness and disease. I was reading last week in the Old Testament, and we were reading about, I was reading about where God began to come against the enemy, and how one of the signs that God was forsaking them, that they had tumors about them. The Bible says the whole tribe had received tumors in their body. And I was reading that this week, and I never read it and thought of it this way before. And I said, there's a clear sign that God wants you to know that that's the sign of the enemy, that that's not a part of his plan. In other words, the identity was on the issue of what they were battling, and they needed a savior and a healer. And because God wants you to identify with him and result in him and live in him, you can be free from all forms of sickness and disease. You say, well, what does that mean? That means Christ is a healer. He's a healer to today. He's a healer tomorrow. He was a healer 2,000 years ago. He can heal tumor. He can heal cancer. He can heal diabetes. He can heal blood disease. He can heal mental illness. He can heal from the guttermost to the uttermost. There's no respecter of persons in God. What he has done by the Sea of Galilee, he can do right here in this room today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God is a healing God because of the cross. That is not going to happen. That has already happened. So maybe you're in this room and you're battling in sickness and disease in your body. I want you to receive what's already been accomplished at Calvary and walk in that freedom and walk in that healing. You say, well, what if God doesn't heal me here? Then you get healed in the sweet by and by in heaven and eternity. I want you to know either way we're going to win this thing when we belong to him. Not only do we have divine healing, but we also have issues that deal with poverty. Because of the triumph and the beauty of the cross, we are free from a poverty mentality. The Bible says that Christ became poor, and then many people this time of year with the conspiracy theories act like Jesus lived on this earth, and he was absolutely devastated without anything. But I don't know about you, when I was a young man, before I was a Christian, I didn't have a lot of resources when I was young. Anybody having struggling with some finances today? And when you struggle with finances, there's often something that happens. You don't have any finances. And when you don't have any finances, you can't buy stuff. And then when you realize there's no money in your pocket, there's no money in your wallet or your purse, and there's no money in the bank account, then you've got some issues. I never, when I was a young man and didn't have anything, I never traveled with a dude like my brother Carlos or my friend, you know, Javier, and said, hey, Javier, you hold on to the money. I don't have any now, but you are holding on to the money for us, so I need some money. No, no. The Bible says that Jesus, when he was on this earth, he traveled with a money changer, somebody that carried the bags of money. His name was Judas. What's the point? You're not broke, busted, and disgusted if you're hanging around with people and you got somebody carrying your resources. If you've ever been broke, there's nobody carrying nothing. My point is he became poor, but the question is when and where did he become poor? He became poor at Calvary for your sake and for my sake. There was a great exchange. All we had for all he had. What a deal. That means I took his prosperity and I gave him my poverty. I took his healing and I gave him my sickness and disease. I took his peace and I gave him my confusion and shame. I took upon him everything that heaven had to offer because of him, and I gave to him everything I had to offer, which was shame, sorrow, sin, and suffering, and lack, and anxiety, and worry, and at the cross, he bared it for me, but he just did not take it all. He gave me something that I could not get on my own. He gave me everlasting life, and he said, he that believeth on me shall never die. Come on, put your hands together, and thank God for the amazing everlasting life he gives. 
Because of the cross, we not only have peace with God, but Jesus said it a certain way. He said, my peace I give unto you. But not as the world gives, but such as I have, I give it unto you. Maybe you're in this room or watching and you're tormented in your mind. Maybe you're struggling with your thoughts. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe you're struggling with trying to find purpose over your life. I'm here today to tell you that Christ was and is and always will be a man of power and purpose that he lived on this earth to show you that he had a divine purpose purpose in the midst of his sorrow in the midst of the pain in the midst of all he went through but he didn't stay that way there was something on the other side of that cross for the joy that was set before him he endured and if Christ can endure it you can endure it if Christ overcame it you can overcome it because greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world I say that to say you don't have to live there if you realize that Christ is more than an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, he is your all in all, and he, friends, can be your everything. He can be your everything. So let's begin with this thought, because the cross is the central theme of the word of God. The fact is, without the cross, we have nothing. We have nothing. If you preach the teachings of Jesus without the cross at the center, you are preaching and teaching another gospel. You are talking rituals without righteousness. You're talking about ceremony, but not true authenticity of Christian living. We're talking about, the Bible says, having a form of godliness. But if you don't put the cross at the center, you're denying the power thereof. Without the cross, it's impossible to be saved. It's impossible to be delivered. It's impossible to be healed. It's impossible to find peace. It's impossible possible to have joy, to have hope for tomorrow, confidence in the day, and to have a destiny that God gives to you if you walk in his covenant. Without the cross, it is impossible to be an heir and a joint heir with him without it. That's why the apostle Paul says, God forbid I should boast except in the cross. Notice he didn't say, God forbid I should boast except in the Sermon on the Mount. Because without the cross, the Sermon on the Mount is just words. You need the cross for everlasting life. So how do you see it? Most people, when they hear messages like this, see the cross as forgiveness of sins, but refuse to accept the cross as a way of life. They do what I call the need factor. Jennifer alluded to it. I need you, God, when I'm going through a crisis. I need you, God, when I have a struggle. I need you, God. And yet they don't want to live the crucified life. They want to live the I need life. I need this and I need that. Reminds me of my first car, 1978 Oldsmobile Delta 88 four-door. I fit like 27 dudes up in that car. My nickname for her, some of you heard my story, Shanita. She needed brakes. She needed mufflers. She needed interior. She needed a paint job and she needed a new motor. So I named her Shanita. Shanita would only start when I literally hit the top of the, of the hood as hard as I could to try to get that carburetor to unstick. Shanita had lots of problems, and many Christians live like Shanita. I, 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 I should need this, God, and I should need that, God, and I need this, God, and I need you to come in this, God, instead of living a crucified life. When he becomes far than a Savior, when he becomes Lord, you can truly live abundant prosperity, faith-filled, joy-filled life. When he controls your life, he controls everything. So many times we want the opposite. We want the Shanita God. God, I'll only come to you when I need you. I, I need you today. But you have to realize you need to live your life every day needing God. Not just in the bad times, but in the good times, in the difficult times. When he becomes more than a savior, he becomes Lord. That means he controls your life. He controls your resources. He controls your gifts and talents. He's the author and the finisher of your time. That means you'll start compartmentalizing your life. Well, I've got family time over here and work time over here, and I've got church time over here, and I've got this time over here. Your time means nothing until you give it all to him. Until you give everything to him. He's the author and he's the finisher of everything. Do you glory in that cross? If the cross was taken out of your life, out of your thoughts, out of your speech, out of your marriage, would people be able to tell the difference? Most of the time, no. It's more than an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. This is deliverance. Many people are saved as far as sin is concerned, but they're not free. They're saved because they've invited Christ into their heart. 
In other words, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. That's a work not in your own strength. That's been given by God supernaturally to anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. That's the down and out. That's the up and out. That's the, that's the whosoever will. Anyone, any walk of life, any background, any ethnicity, any upbringing, it doesn't matter. From the guttermost to the uttermost, you call upon him, you'll be saved. That means salvation is assured through Jesus and the cross. But many people don't realize they're saved as far as sin is concerned, but they're not free. How do we know when we're free? Because what once bound us no longer binds us anymore. Many people are saved, but they're not free. How do we know when freedom comes to a life? Because the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. How do we operate in freedom? We know that once what's bound in us no longer binds us anymore. When I got saved in 1997, now when I use that term, I had never been at church before. I wasn't raised in church. I had no religious background. But when I was invited to church on May 18th, 1997, I received Christ into my life. I confessed him as, as Lord that night, and I confessed him as Savior. But I didn't know the difference of Savior and Lord. So when I gave my heart to Christ, immediately my spirit man, my spirit became born again. But how many of you know I had some work to do? I had some areas in my life that were, weren't, weren't free. I was saved as far as sin and forgiveness was concerned, but I had some issues that I wasn't free in. Now, when you're raised on your own as a little boy, I was 11 years old, put out on my own on the streets. I had some certain habits and hangups and hurts that not everybody has as a little boy. So I had some issues. I had some issues dealing with my mentality. I had some issues dealing with my life. I had issues dealing with habits that I had accumulated because of being on my own. And when I started to read that word, I'll never forget it. May 18th, 1997, I gave my heart to the Lord and I became born again, my spirit. But the areas that I needed to be free in were cumulative. They just came more and more and more as I got into that word. I'll never forget it. As I'm reading that Bible in 1997, I had a beer in my hand. Now, before you talk about drinking or not drinking, I'm not trying to convict any of you, but I'm talking about a stronghold in my life. I was 11 years old. I started to drink, and I wasn't like a casual drinker. Mad Dog 2020 was a friend of mine. I mean, Old English 800. I mean, I wasn't drinking like Bud Light. I mean, I was drinking. And so I'm I'm reading my Bible in the house that I had bought before I was 18 years old, bought and paid for. I had no mortgage. I, and I had some other issues I was dealing with that wasn't legal. I've been in and out of juvenile hall and youth authorities. I had some issues I was working on. And so I'm reading my Bible one day, and I have my scriptures open to the book of John. Again, nobody put me in a discipleship class. I'm just reading the Word of God. And as I'm reading the book of John, I'm reading it like this, and I've got my Old English 800 on the table. And as I'm drinking the Old English 800, you know, I'm just sipping, you know, I'm just sipping, I'm, sipping, I'm just used to it. I realize that I don't need this any longer. This is a stronghold in my life that I need to give over to the Lord. So what I did, I'd encourage some of you to do with areas in your life that become strongholds, whether it's alcohol, drugs, relationships, it doesn't matter what it is. What is a stronghold, it's an area you're not free in. That's a stronghold. That area for me, now some of you, you sip wine in your time, and you're all good with it, that's fine. If you want to be a Holy Ghost wino, be my guest. But for me, I don't go to the liquor store and read the labels. Some of you get that on the drive home. So if I'm going in the liquor store, it's not to read the labels. I'm getting some Mad Dog 2020. So I have to eliminate that out because I have to choose which day and the God in whom I serve. And so for me, that was a stronghold that had to be given over to God. And May 18th was the day I became a born-again person, but that next week is where I became a free person in that life. And I've never touched alcohol since, not because I'm stronger than the Mad Dog 2020, because the Mad Dog will make you local in the cavessa. It's not that I'm stronger than that, but greater is he that's within me than he that's within this world. 
And how do I know that freedom has come? Because I'm no longer bound to alcohol anymore. Some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. The area that holds you back. The area that keeps away the things of God. The relationships. The mentality. The mindsets. Some of you need to operate in giving Jesus your everything. Not just Savior on Sunday. Let him be Lord on Monday. Lord on Tuesday. Lord on Wednesday. Lord on Thursday. And Freaky Friday is no longer freaky. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And Saturday is Yahweh. It belongs to God. See, there's a difference between knowing Jesus as a Savior and accepting him as a Lord. That's what a disciple is. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. A disciple hints the word discipline, and discipline is somebody who does what Jesus does. They live in a covenant relationship with God and with each other that they lean and glean on that know the Lord. In other words, they're not living with people that have no mindsets of God. They're not dealing with people all the time. Even though they have to interact with them, they're not letting them take over their time, their talents, their treasures. They're letting God be glorified in everything that they do. Do you glory in that cross? Many people are saved as far as sin is concerned, but they're not free. How do we know the area that we're not free in, Joey? I'm glad you asked. You're controlled by other people. That's how you know you're not free. You're controlled by religious rules, how you were taught as a little boy, a little girl. You're controlled about false concepts about God our Father and Jesus Christ. And today, by the grace of God, I want you to experience a supernatural breakthrough and the power of the Word of God to set you free because the cross delivers us when we give it over to Him. And it delivers us from this thing called legalism. What is legalism? Legalism defined as simple, keeping man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. That's why the apostle Paul says, but God forbid. Let's say that together, but God forbid. Those three words are essential for your freedom over legalism. Again, keeping man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Why does he start verse 12 with God forbid, or or verse 14? Because in verse 12, he was dealing with false teachers. He was dealing with these legalists. They were teaching the church that you can be saved, and if you want to be saved, believe on the cross and be circumcised. In other words, there's something else I want you to do that is a man-made rule. What he was saying is you're not saved by the cross alone. You're saved by the cross and adding this man-made rule. That's legalism. That's why the apostle Paul thunders back and says, but God forbid. What is the point of legalism? Again, keeping man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Have you ever had somebody come and tell you, I know you're saved, but. I know you're saved, but. You know, I see that you got saved, but. Anybody who adds a butt to your salvation, you need to show them yours. You need to get out of there. I know you're saved, but now you've got to dress this way. I know you're saved, but now you've got to let your hair grow down. I know you're saved, but now you've got to wear a skirt all the time. Now you're saved, but if you have long hair, ladies, put it in a bun. Thou shalt have no bondage, by the way. Now you're saved. But when they add the butt, you need to show them yours. Because we're not saved plus something. You're not saved plus this circumcision or plus man-made rule or plus this. It's the cross plus nothing that sets you and I free. It's the blood plus nothing that removes the stain of sin. Come on, help me preach it. It's the blood plus nothing that conquers the forces of hell. It's the blood plus nothing that sets the captive free. It's the blood plus nothing that heals you of every form of sickness and disease. It's the blood plus nothing that makes demons tremble when you roll over in bed. It's the blood plus nothing that sets the captive free, that heals the broken heart, that sets at liberty all those who proclaim the year of the Lord. It's the blood plus nothing. Give him praise. Again. It's not the cross plus circumcision. It's not the cross plus staring at a statue, praying to a statue in repetition. It's not the cross plus crawling down the aisle of some cathedral, kissing the toe of a statue. It's not the cross plus giving to the church or giving to Africa or giving to the orphans or giving to my church. It's the cross and the cross alone that sets you free. Some people, they live in a religious hell created by legalism. They've created this hell created by legalism, and they tied God up in it. 
because of the way they were raised or what they were taught, the false concepts about God, the hurts that they claim that were caused by God because it's a church. Church have problems because church have people. The next time you want to find a perfect church, there will be no people then because people will mess up a perfect church. Nobody perfect except Christ. You find a perfect church, you join it, you will ruin it. Because you ain't perfect, nor am I. But Paul is something here that is amazing because some people, they live in this hell created by legalism. Why? Because if you can be saved by what you do, then Christ went to the cross in vain. If you can be saved by the color of your hair, the clothes you wear, or what you say and what you don't say, then Christ went to the cross in vain. Paul says if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. That means you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what he did for you at Calvary. And if you're saved by what you do, that makes the cross unnecessary. You're saved because of the cross and no other reason. Legalism is worse than drunkenness. Listen to me. Legalism is worse than stealing or theft or, 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 or immorality or adultery or any of that. You say, well, can you prove that? Yes, I can. Because the Apostle Paul is an overseer of churches. As a matter of fact, he is a church leader and planting churches. And as he's planting churches, he's talking to different churches that he's planting. And one of the churches he's talking to is the church at Corinthian, at Corinth. And in the Corinthian church, we hear the Apostle Paul greet his church. And he says, grace and peace be unto you by our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for you by the grace that was given to you. Why is that important? Because he is showing the church his love for them. He's saying, grace and peace be unto you by our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for you. Why, Why is that important? Because the church in Corinth had some issues. As a matter of fact, they had some problems. And in the problems of the church, one of the problems they were having, they were getting stone cold drunk at communion. I don't mean they were bringing the mad dog in. They were taking the communion wine and like, lock, 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 lock. They were getting so drunk at communion, the Bible says they were falling down drunk. How I many know that ain't cool at all? When we have communion this, this Friday, we're not having wine. We're going to have Welch's grape juice, only the best. And I'm not knocking people that take communion with wine. I'm just saying they were getting drunk at communion. They weren't coming in drunk. They were getting drunk at church with the communion. How I many know that's not cool? Not only were they getting drunk at communion, they were being immoral with people in their families. That's called incest. That's gross. Not only were they getting drunk, having issues in the family, but they also had mismanagement with the church's money. So in 1 Corinthians, he lays it out to them and says, you're all in error. You need to repent. So you know what the church at Corinth did? They didn't say, I'm going to another church where so-and-so will love me right. No, they listened to the man of God. They received the correction, and they repented. And when they repented, that's when he said, grace and peace be unto you by our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for you by, by the gift that was given to you. Why so loving and so kind? Because they heeded his words and they repented of it. What's the point in that? The point is, he is the overseer of that church, and they took heed of what he said, and they changed. They knew that freedom had come into the house because there was change. There wasn't just the same old thing, well, we listen to Paul, but we kind of get drunk now with communion. Oh, we still mess around with family members. Oh, we only take a little bit of the church's money. One for the church, two for me. Two for the church, one, two, three for me. No, no, they repented. And when they repented, they changed. Now listen to Paul's greeting to another church. Remember, he's overseeing these churches. This is another church. This is the Galatian church. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, listen to what he says about this church. The first church that's doing this wild stuff, they says, grace and peace be unto you by our Lord Jesus. He's gracious to him. He's kind to him. He's loving to him. Listen to the other church he's overseeing. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, please understand, the word foolish is a harsh word. You read it in the New Testament, it's not a word we use today as being harsh, but the Bible says if you call your brother or sister a fool, you're in dangers of hellfire. So he's saying, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What he's saying is, you're under the influence of witchcraft. Think about it. This is a church. 
The Galatians were saved. They were spirit-filled. They were filled with the Spirit of God. All the signs and wonders were operating in the church. This is the First Testament, the New Testament church. That's how the church started. It started with signs, wonders, and miracles. And then man-made rules came and dulled it down throughout the millennia and throughout centuries and began to organize religion and organize man-made rules. And you have to have this to that and this for that and this for that. And Paul says, you are under the influence of witchcraft. You have these miracles happening, but somewhere along the line, you've lost touch. He is talking to a church, a saved, spirit-filled, charismatic church. You could say an oasis church, because that's what we believe, the infilling of the spirit, the gifts of tongue, interpretation of tongue, the gifts of healing, the gifts of prophecy. We believe all that. That's our fundamentals. That's our core value. And that's this church's core value. And listen to what he says. He says, you're under the spirit of witchcraft. The miracles that are done among you, Galatians 3 verse 5 says. He says, are they done by the law, legalism, or witchcraft, or faith? Witchcraft is the end result of legalism, keeping man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Witchcraft is the control of other people. Listen to how witchcraft works in the modern day. You may find somebody you know or a situation you're currently going through. Four methods of manifestation in the New Testament. One of them is intimidation. One of them is manipulation. Another one is domination. And the fourth is condemnation. Legalism is the way Satan controls the church that's lost its vision of the cross. Legalism is how it is controlled There are churches all in our world, in our society, in this community that control the body with intimidation, manipulation, domination, and condemnation. And they tie it to man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Everybody has operated in that, including this amigo. I say that because you have to learn to decide what you're going to let on, let go, and what you're going to embrace. How does that work in this spirit of witchcraft? Using guilt. You can be driven by the spirit of condemnation by driven with guilt. How does it work? Some self-appointed, self-anointed, goody two-shoes comes along and says, you know, if you were really being spiritual, you wouldn't have to go through all you're going through. You know, if you really love God the way that you do, you wouldn't be going through all that stuff. I know they said that to Job. I know they said that to Joseph. You know, Joseph, if you would have loved God and loved your brothers more, they wouldn't have thrown you in the pit. There's there's something that happens when you get around the wrong people and they begin to decide that you're not where you need to be with God. If you live in a spiritual life, this wouldn't be happening to you. I'm sure that was said to some of you. They say, hey, I I remember what you did back in that sin. I remember what you did back in 1962. I remember what you did back in 1982, 92, 2002. I know what you did last night in the Motel 6. And here comes this spirit of condemnation. And remember, the guilt begins to eat, and now you're under the control of that person or that group of people, not the Holy Spirit, not the anointing of the Word of God. You're under the control of that self-anointed, a self-appointed person. But the spirit of condemnation over other people or groups of people start running your life. So can Pastor Steelman give you a word of encouragement for you and over you today? That's why you need to take control of your life or someone else will. Take control of your life or someone or something will. Don't let anyone steal your joy. Don't let anyone dehumanize you. Don't let someone make you feel inferior. Don't you make you feel unwanted. Don't make someone feel you unworthy or feel without value because Christ went to the cross for you. He has saved you. Satan wants to remind you of the past, but God wants to remind you of your beautiful future that he has for you, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you hope and and give you a great victory. You have to know that. And your future has to move into you before you ever move into your future. Let the Holy Spirit give you a God-given vision of your future. Let him give you a vision of victory. Let him give you a vision of success. Let him give him a vision of victory over your children. Let him give a vision over you, over your health, over your home, over your finances, over your emotions. I want you to see it happening for you right here, right now. Not the best is going to come. The best has already come because Christ has already borne it. He's already carried it. He's already brought the victory. 
So what I'm saying to you right now, I want you to get a vision of absolute victory. I'm saying to you right now, I want you to get a vision of divine health and healing in your body that's riddled with sickness. I want you to get a vision of your children rising back up and calling you blessed no matter what age they are currently. I want you to get a vision of being healthy and strong, living a physical, strong, robust life the rest of your life. I want you to get a vision of financial freedom over you, over your children, over your destiny, over your life legacy. I want you to get a vision of your enemies coming in one way and have to flee out seven ways. I want you to get a God-given vision over your marriage. Your husband will serve the Lord. He will lead you to the things of God. Your wife will serve the Lord. You're single people. You're going to get a godly spouse. I want you to see what God sees for your life. I want you to catch a freedom of total victory over your life personal freedom, not just corporate freedom, personal freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can we put our hands together and thank the Lord today? As Wren comes and we close, every person in every denomination has its own brand of legalism. I say that because even this church, you have to understand when that happens to your life personally or corporately, you have to evaluate. And when you evaluate, you have to learn what is good and what is God. What is permissible and acceptable and what is sovereign that God wants you to live in. But if you only come and go out of a crisis, you'll never live to your divine potential. You will live under this witchcraft of denominationalism and the witchcraft of what we would call legalism. Because every denomination, and denomination is only a way to get you to God. So don't look at denominations as a bad word. There's nothing wrong with most denominations. It's not that's the issue. It's when they allow the legalism of that issue to dictate how you come to God. Good meaning people that love God and love Jesus with all their heart. They pray to the statue, but that statue cannot save you, it cannot help you, and it cannot heal you. There is the cross plus nothing. People pray in vain repetition over and over, but Jesus told us, don't pray like the heathen pray. Why do I say that? Because good, well-meaning people have their denominations, and they have their own way of looking at God, and it causes them to live under a bondage that God never intended them to live under. Not only does praying in repetition doesn't do it, but crawling down the aisle of a cathedral, kissing the toe of a statue, it will not bring you healing. Christ paid for it at the cross. You're healed by the cross plus nothing. Your sins are forgiven because of the blood. Not because of a man, not because of a denomination, not because of something you have this idea of what brought you. Jesus did it himself. So I give you a, I give you a, a new thought today. And here it is. If God didn't make the rule, forget the rule. If God didn't make the rule, forget the rule. If the Bible doesn't support the rule, forget the rule. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I would never, and I have another thought before we close, but I never should you hear a minister, a preacher. You should never hear them and think of it as absolute. You should think of a message as discovery. And you should discover what is being said. Is it true or is it an error? Because you should never take what somebody says as absolute until you have governed it with this word. You have to have an anchor of truth. That's why I say, I'm not trying to influence you, I'm trying to inform you so you can be imparted to. But you have to do your part and open up discovery. It's what a good lawyer does when he's getting ready to get on a case, he opens up discovery. And you are a lawyer, an advocate, a lawyer, Jesus, and he's on the case. And you need to discover what he wants you to stay away from, and you need to discover what he wants you to accept. Because every church, listen to us, or me, I should say, every church that practices legalism is under a curse. That's not my opinion. That's from St. Paul himself. He declares it. Galatians 3.10, for as many are under the law, that's legalism, are under a curse. Why? Because they've abandoned grace. And they're under the law. And the message of grace is the greatest message that we can possibly hear. 
There are churches all over that have abandoned the grace message and they've applied the man-made rule message because it's easier to tell a person they got a demon in them to keep them in the church. It's easier to tell them they got to look a certain way, act a certain way, and talk a certain way, and worship a certain way so they'll keep them in the church. But I'm telling you today, God has made you an individual. He's made you special. There's nobody like you. You are not a cheap carbon copy. You are a wonderful original. And God doesn't manufacture junk, and he doesn't sponsor flops. And he has made you specifically to be a person that stands out. And I encourage you today by this message, don't live under the law of legalism because it brings upon you a curse. Live and discover for yourself how God can use you in these days in which we live in. I share that as we close. We're not here to tell people how bad they are. People know how bad they are. You think I need somebody to tell me my faults? Not hardly. I am riddled with faults. I am bald. I get a kick out of Pastor Marie. I, I've, and, and I've known her for years and years. But when I'm, I make uh, jokes about being handsome, you know, the handsome bald man, she's like, oh, you're so, not. what's the word she uses? It's much more confident. And I'm like, there's no bald man on the planet who's confident. He's bald, okay? There's issues. There's issues. We need to take an offering and go take me to Turkey where they have the real deal. I've seen it. You take a flight to Turkey, they give you Turkish coffee, you come back with a full head of hair. Can we take, I'll find out the price. We'll work on it. See if we can take care of this. Come on, team. You can come. Enough about my Turkish hairdo. But my point in that, we're not here to tell people how bad they are. We're here to tell people how much God loves them and how God sees them and how God wants the best for them. My challenge all these years being under this burden is I couldn't see beyond the fire of the need to keep doing stuff to realize all the thing that I ever needed was already locked up inside of me. And all I needed to do was keep my focus where it needed to be. And God would have lifted it, I believe, a lot sooner. But it took a linchpin for me to finally see in that thing to be lifted off me to now say, now it comes upon you. Because you can't do church like the way you've used to do church. You can't just keep coming once a month or once every other month and not seeing yourself as God sees you. That's not going to work anymore. You've been given too much, you've been told too much, and there's too much on the inside of you. You will be absolutely miserable, not because of man-made rules. It's because of the eternal, sovereign God has put something in you that you have to and you need to fulfill. And I share that to say to you today. The message for you today is empty yourself so God could use you. Your sin is already finding you out. It's no surprise to God. It may surprise your spouse, your family. It'll definitely surprise me. I'm like, you crazy. But it doesn't surprise God. God already knows everything you've gone through. He already knows the faults and all. He knows all of it. So my point is, why would you keep trying to entangle yourself up from a mindset or an upbringing that's only kept you legally down in the spirit? And legalism has just corroded and corrupted how you see God. It's corrupted how you receive from me because of the way in which legalism has come in, man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. And we get up here every week for the last 15 years saying, everything that you have is on the inside. You can have freedom. You can have healing. You can have joy. You can have laughter. You can have holiness. You can have anointing. You can have prosperity. You can have the gifts and talents explode. You can have the gifts of faith. You can have the gifts of tongue. You can have the gifts of interpretation of tongue. Not tied by a religion, by what skirt you wear or how long your hair is. Not tied to religion. You're saved only if you do those things. You're already saved because of what Jesus did for you. Now you got to walk in the covenant of God. That requires emptying out yourself and saying, God, use me. Use me. Can we stand together all over the building? 
I thought about this service, what I would say to you as we close. And I really didn't come up with nothing profound. I wish I did because I'm a profound guy. But I really didn't come up with anything profound, Sharif. The only thing I came up with is empty yourself. I would get on my knees, but my pants are still a little tight. But I'm, you, I'm in the spirit there, okay? We're going there. Might be a show back here we're not wanting to see. Cherie says, don't do it. We're not going to do it. Still a work in progress. But I, but I really, I want us to get on our knees spiritually. Empty yourself. I'd like the young people who are really serious about this before the others join, the young students in this room, the young adults in this room, if you want God to use you, I'm telling you today to empty yourself. Your hurts, your pains, your agony, your worry, your anxiety, your OCD, empty yourself. Why don't you step out of where you're at, young man, young lady, and why don't you lead us to this altar and show us what serving God is really like. I'll wait for you. Come on, we'll wait. Some more people, some more young people. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. On, young people. Yeah, yeah, they're all over here. They're all over the room. They're all over the room. Come on, there's some more of you in the back. Come on, if you're willing. He's willing. This burden has to be transferred. This, this garment has to be transferred. Now I want those of you in this auditorium, those of you watching, I say to you, what area do you need to get on your knees spiritually and do? What areas do you need to give over to God? The sin, the disappointment, the upbringing, the legalism, what is it that needs to be given over to God? You say, well, there's lots of things, and I want you to step out of your seat and join these young students right here at this altar. I want you to come as they sing over you for a moment. Let the gifts and power and anointing of God rest on you as you empty yourself out today. Empty out the anxiety, empty out the worry, empty out the bad upbringing, empty out the pain of the past, empty out the discouragement of yesterday, empty out the sin that you've been, been setting you and causing you grief, empty out right now all the things that have haunted you, empty it and let Holy Spirit put inside you greatness. Come on. Anybody else need to empty themselves today? Just step out, get in that aisle. Make a movement toward God. Don't just stand. Make a movement toward God. The Holy Spirit's pricking the heart. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, move on the hearts of your sons. Move on the hearts of your daughters. Move on their hearts. young man I see you over there in the spirit there's a red light warning over your life your life is not promised what you need to do is give your life to Christ you need to give your life to Christ young man you need to come to that altar right now young man in the room in the back I see you in the spirit you need to receive Christ you need to fulfill your destiny young lady you need to fulfill your destiny Come on, anybody want him? Just put those hands up right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
say this prayer together. I want you to say this with me today. Heavenly Father, today I receive freedom. I receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the forgiveness of sins. I confess that I have sinned. I have made mistakes. And today, by your grace, I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am loved. I am chosen. I am favored. I am anointed. And I am called. Today, I know you as Savior. But I want to know you as Lord. I want to know you as my all in all, my everything. I give you everything. My talents, my good, my bad, the things I'm not proud of, and the things I'm very proud of. I give them to you. They belong to you. Take my life and use it for your glory, for your power, for your anointing, for your goodness. I receive the best of what you have for me today, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give God a praise. Can we put our hands together? Yay. Come on, we're going to keep worshiping. These altars are going to stay open. Father, we love you. Thank you for the grace and anointing. Be glorified in us and through us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 